And now we are live on our Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. We're live on Spreaker. We're live on TikTok. We're live on Instagram. So we're pretty much live on all of our formats. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking this beautiful, beautiful Sunday. Uh, Sunday, jeez, I'm telling you, that's that's the kind of week I've had already. Uh, this uh, this beautiful Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. That's where we are. We are on Wednesday. I'm telling you, uh, we are we're really excited. Uh, for those of you who don't know, let me just give you a couple. Um, all right. Uh, so let's see, see already, see already the trolls, see already trolls. Uh, and, and it's always this mentality that you're not on the right team. I, I'm on Jesus Christ team. So I'm on the right team, sunshine. Doesn't matter what denomination. So just knock it off. And people just so, so aggressive, so rude already, already we have trolls already. Um, okay. So we're going to fix this problem right now. So for those of you who are on, oh, hello there from Kentucky. I'm from Kentucky as well. Uh, unfortunately, on TikTok, I have to put subscriber chat only because already we're dealing with trolls. Nope, nope, nope. You're done. You're done. You're out of here. So uh, we have to we have to deal with that. Ridiculous. Uh, okay, a couple things. If you want to go to my website, thank you, CJ. If you want to go to my website, it's bishopjameslongl-o-n-g.com. Bishopjameslongl-o-n-g.com. Uh, that is my website. I do have an online store there. You can go there if you want to purchase some items. It'll be great. Uh, also, the church's website. The church's website is usocc.org. Well, hello there, Michelle. usocc.org. That's the website. So one more time, Bishop James Long, L-O-N-G dot com. And usocc.org. That is the church's website. Now, uh, we have a church retreat coming up March 14th to the 17th. So uh, we have some deacons that's going to be ordained to the priesthood. And then, of course, we have our, our wonderful uh, Benedictines who are going to be making their perpetual vows. So that's really exciting, too. So we're looking forward to that. Really looking forward to that. And um, uh, a w wonderful Joanne Health. So, by the way, I want to personally and publicly, and, I, and, I, and she's probably going to she's probably gonna beat me up when I say it, but that's okay. Uh, Judy Ann. I want to uh, publicly thank Judy Ann. Uh, Judy Ann is on TikTok. Uh, she is a dear friend, truly a dear friend. And, you know, we're going to do, we, we need, we needed a uh, projector uh, for our, our retreat. And not only that, but the sound system, you know, a soundboard. Uh, and so she was so, and other items that she dedicated and, and, um, uh, she donated that, and I want to, you know, really thank her for that. That was a very unbelievably kind gesture, uh, because I had, <laughs> I have a projector. I'll okay, I have a projector, but it really, I'm not kidding you. It's from the flip. It's not even. It doesn't even have HDMI. There's no HDMI input. Uh, it doesn't have Wi-Fi. It doesn't have HDMI. It's the. It doesn't connect to anything new, uh, so it's just like. How am I going to get this to connect? Uh, so uh, that was kind of like, oh, how, what are we going to do? Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, Judy and thank you for for doing that. That's going to really come in handy when we have our our movie night, and it's also going to really come in handy when we do our our uh, presentations. So we'll be doing we'll be teaching there as well. I I, ha I don't know. There is a possibility. It it just depends, guys. It just depends. People have are asking, are we going to air it? Uh, or are we going to film it? We're, we're not going, we will not do it. Uh, we will not air the um, the ordinations. And the reason being is because we're going to be very busy that day and worrying about technology and if this works or that's, it's just too much. But what we will do, uh, I really would like to um, go to the USOCC parish page on Facebook. And we're go. I would like to set up some type of system to where uh, we can air that to the group only to the group only. So uh, if um, we're, we're going to work on that, I, I want to, I really do because uh, Reverend Mother is going to be doing a presentation and uh, well, thank you there, Jackie. Thank you. And also um, our Abbot is going to be doing a presentation. I'll be doing a presentation. And so uh, we are going to try to air that to the USOCC Facebook page. So here's what you need to do. If you want to go to that site, um, let me tell you, it's, let me find it so I won't tell you wrong. And then we'll get into our Bible study in just a second. Yeah, here it is. Go to usocc.org. Okay, usocc.org. And you'll see it right there. It says, to become a prisoner of the USOCC, uh, please visit our group page. If you click that and just request to join, 
then you'll be able to watch our, the presentations uh, for our retreat. And by the way, I we have we have the retreat schedule. It is up, and so you can also find out what time they will be doing this. So if you well, thank you, thank you for the thank you, thank you guys for offering gifts to the ministry. Thank you. So if you go to usocc.org and click on the retreat button and then scroll down to it says USOCC retreat schedule and it'll tell you uh, the uh, the lectures. So uh, our Abbott at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Friday will be doing what is a chaplain lecture. And then we're going to be doing our ordination run through. Uh, we have uh, ordinations. Uh, I'll be doing the history of the old Catholic church as well as the popes. So that's really, it's going to be a very interesting presentation. You'll be, you might be surprised. And uh, so I'll be doing that from one to one forty-five, And then uh, after that, uh, we'll have the stations of the cross. We might air that. I just simply don't know. We'll have to see. And then on the 16th, uh, our abbot is also going to be giving a lecture on the, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. yeah, what is the chaplet? And then he'll be doing last rites lecture. So what, what happens during the last rites? What do we do? What does that look like? What can you expect? That kind of thing, which is important. And then from two to three, our Reverend Mother is going to be giving a liturgical chant lecture. So if you ever want, you know, how, how, how do we chant during mass? Well, she'll be, she'll be doing that. And that's, uh, again, uh, from uh, two to three. But anyway, the schedule's there. The schedule's there. So feel free to go to usocc.org. Click on the retreat button. And there we go. Uh, how are our, our, our priests on doing questions about Catholicism during a new uh, uh, doing a new book? Oh, well, oh, thank you very much for the universe, Gail. Thank you very much, and thank you. What happened uh, for the for the gifts, the heart puff? Um, how open are priests on doing research about Catholicism? Doing a new book, wanting research. Oh well, uh, Lynn, you can uh, contact uh, any of our clergy. Uh, our clergy would be more than happy to, to help you. I'll be more than happy to help you and. Uh, so, yeah, just a message, and I'm uh, more than happy to do that. Okay. Full screen? Yeah, it should, be, it, should, it should be fine now. I don't know why it would freeze. All right, let's get into a Bible study. Uh, before we do, I want to say something. <clears throat> and uh, because I think it's important. Uh, just send me, send me a message on Facebook. And by the way, if you want to know what my um, people always ask, well, what are I have, by the way, all of my presentations are on Spreaker. So we have podcast. All you got to do is just go to bishopjameslong.com, scroll down to where it says social media links. It's all there. The, the, my, make sure to go to YouTube and subscribe. Please subscribe. It's free. Uh, there is a new, and, and this is what I want to say for, every, for everybody on TikTok. Please make sure you go there to subscribe. There, uh, once again, in the political world, they're talking again about banning TikTok. And it's like, oh, just leave us alone. Just, just stop. Uh, but anyway, they're doing that. They're talking again. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just letting people know, please, please, please go to my YouTube page and subscribe. Subscribe. Everybody, please go to my YouTube. By the way, I'm going to start being I'm going to start doing documentaries there and it will only air on the YouTube page. So make sure you go there. Thank you. And thank you. Um, and for TikTok, for those of you who are offering gifts to the ministry, thank you very much. I appreciate it. If I don't say thank you, I want to apologize first. And that's only because now I have three computers running at the same time. I have TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Spreaker. And then over here, my friends that are on Instagram. So, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, if I don't see it, it's, it's, I apologize. So let me talk about something that's on my mind. I want to talk to you briefly today. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, about the importance of attending Bible study and the significance of embracing different styles of teaching and preaching. So, in, you know, in our journey of faith, I think it's crucial to seek God's words and to delve deep into the teachings of Scripture, to grow spiritually through Bible study and reflection. You know, when it comes to Bible study, we may encounter preachers who exhibit different learning or different styles of teaching. Some may be charismatic, filled with energy and passion and, and draw us in with their enthusiasm and fervor. Others may be more methodical, uh, taking a calm and systematic approach to exploring the scripture. 
guiding us through each passage with careful consideration and precision. I, I think I fall into that type of camp. I think it's essential for us to understand that both styles are valid and both styles are real and can effectively communicate the love and compassion of Christ. You know, whether charismatic or methodical, what, what truly matters is the message that's being conveyed, the message of God's grace, mercy, salvation through Christ. I think we have to guard against the temptation to dismiss or criticize preachers simply because their style of teaching does not align with our own personal preferences. You know, God's work, God works in mysterious ways. And he may use different preachers to reach different hearts and souls. So we must remember that our focus should always be on the content of the message and the truth of the gospel rather than the delivery style of the preacher. Let's not be quick to, to judge or condemn those who faithfully proclaim the word of God. Even if their approach may not resonate with us, instead let us approach Bible study with open hearts and minds, seeking to learn, to grow in our faith, regardless of their teaching style employed. You know, God's ways are higher than our ways. His plans are, are beyond our, our understanding. Let's not hinder the work of God by allowing personal preferences or biases to cloud our judgment or say, well, this is real Bible study and that's not real Bible study. That's not fair. Said, let us embrace diversity in teaching styles, recognizing that ultimately it is the Holy Spirit who guides us into uh, into the truth. Thank you, Missy. Thank you. You know, I, we have to be careful. Once we start dismissing uh, this particular style of teaching or that particular style, and then you, then, or we start attacking that type of preacher or this type of preacher because we don't like their preaching, you, you need to be really careful because God, in my opinion, if, the, if that preacher is preaching the true word of God, of love and compassion to everyone, and they're spreading that message, although that message may not resonate with you, God purposely put that person out there to proclaim his message. And you never know that perhaps maybe someone turned away from God, they turn away completely and they fell into atheism. And then they go through TikTok or social media and they're flipping through and they, and they go to a particular preacher that perhaps maybe you didn't like. Perhaps maybe you didn't think they were doing real Bible study. Those words hurt. And we have to be careful to dismiss, not to ever dismiss people because they're preaching a different metho method in preaching Bible study. Because perhaps maybe that person who's flipping through TikTok or social media, maybe they, maybe they resonate with that preacher. Maybe that preacher who is very methodical says something and something clicks. And that person starts thinking about what that preacher said. Perhaps maybe that individual who turned away from God then starts listening to that preacher a bit more. And perhaps maybe even one day listens to the Holy Spirit and turns back towards God. You see, this is why I, I never ever fall into the temptation of diminishing other people's uh, preaching, preaching style or methodology, uh, because we, we all, we're all different. I, I, I agree. I'm very methodical, and this is the way I and And the reason is, by the way, the reason is I teach Bible study the way I do is because I follow the Catholic Mass Sunday readings. Now, you don't have to when you're teaching Bible study. That doesn't make it invalid if you do or don't, because you're still preaching the Word of God. The reason we do this is because we take a reading from the Old Testament, we take one of the epistles in the New Testament, and then we take a gospel reading. All three readings have a theme. They're both talking, they're all, all three are talking about one theme. So that's the point of why we take an Old Testament reading, one of the epistles in the New Testament, and the gospel. That's the same way that if you're going to teach Bible study, and let's say you were going to preach about love, well, then you'd find readings from the Old Testament, New Testament, in the Bible period about love. That's the theme. And that's what I do, and that's why I follow, uh, in my opinion, uh, the Catholic Sunday readings, because every, every Sunday there is a theme, and it's real, and it's valid. So let's not immediately dismiss someone because of whatever reason 
uh, personal than you know vendetta, or perhaps you just don't like the style, and that's okay. That's okay. Thank you. So as we engage in Bible study, let's do so with humility, respect, willingness to learn from all who faithfully proclaim the word of God. Thank you, Gail. So may our hearts be open to receive God's message in whatever form it may come. May we grow in faith and wisdom and to, to seek to deepen our relationship with Christ. That's just something that I wanted to briefly talk about today. All right. Oh, well, thank you there, the Facebook user. And I don't know who that is, but I appreciate that. Let's go into our fourth week of, of uh, Lent. So this is our reading for this Sunday. Okay. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully that resonated with some folks. I, I think um, just something that I've been contemplating. But okay. Oh, thank you, Gail. That's amazing. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. For those of you offering gifts to the ministry, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, Sunday is the fourth Sunday of Advent. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm already ready for Christmas. <laughs> uh, okay. First Sunday of Lent. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 4 through 16. Thank you. And 19 through 23. Okay. And again, for those of you, if you know that I keep saying thank you, it's because people are offering gifts to the ministry. So that's why. I tell you, I'm telling you, it is ready for ready for uh, ready for Advent. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 14 through 16, and 19 through 23. Why does it break it up? Because again, there's a theme. There's a reason. There's a theme we're teaching. It says uh, in in those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the, and the people, added infidelity to infidelity. Uh, practicing all the abominations of the nations, thank you, and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place, but they mocked the messengers of God, despising his warnings, and scoffed at the prophets until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. See, their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword he carried captive to Babylon, where they became his and his servants, uh, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord, spoken by Jeremiah, until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths. During all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest while 70 years are fulfilled. In the, first years of, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this pro proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, of, of, of the, all the kings of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. And if we are at Mass, we'd say the word of the Lord. Okay. And for those of you, oh, th oh Missy, thank you very much. I, you guys are amazing. Thank you for the gifts. To, uh, truly, thank you. And for those of you who are subscribing, thank you for subscribing as well on TikTok. I sincerely appreciate all of you. Let me explain this one to you, everybody, okay? I, I feel terrible because I know that I'm missing people uh, who are offering gifts and I can't see it. And I just, I feel so, but thank you, everybody. So the book of Second Chronicles, it covers the uh, same time period as First and Second Kings. Uh, as the case with uh, Samuel and Kings, the two books of Chronicles were originally one book, but appear as two in the Greek version of the Bible, the Septuagint. And this division is maintained in the Vulgate and uh, in later editions, the Latin, uh, and later editions, including the Hebrew Bible. The inspired writer was probably a Levite from Jerusalem, uh, given his respectful attention to the temple and its institutions. He probably edited the, te the text if one accepts Ezra and Nehemiah as the original authors, as some have suggested, so after the death of those prophets and before the third century BC since Sirach takes it as uh, read in the year 180 BC. Now, Second Chronicles, it focuses on the history of Solomon, 
And after the division of the kingdom, it concentrates on the kingdom of Judah and its kings, who, by the way, who are all in the line of David. And finally, the book finishes with an account of the fall of Jerusalem, exiled to Babylon, and the, the edict of Cyrus, the king of Persia, allowing the Jews to return to Israel. So that is what our reading is for the first reading is today. Okay, well, thank you. Welcome. So let me break this down for you. In those days, all thank you. All, in, all, in all those, uh, in in those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which He had conse consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send His messengers to them, for He had compassion on His people and His dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Uh, burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces of fire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Thank you again for the gifts. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar, let me explain this. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Chal the Chaldeans, the country of which Babylon was the capital, invaded Judah in 605 BC and exiled many of the craftsmen to Babylon. In 597 BC, he conquered Jerusalem, at which exiling the, uh, aristocracy of, uh, the aristocrats to Babylon. And he destroyed the temple uh, when he uh, quelled the revolt of Zedekiah, thank you, in 586 BC. And he even exiled even more Jews. So it says in 20, those who escaped the sword, he carried captive to Babylon, where they became his and his son's servants until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken to Jeremiah until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths during all the time it lies waste. It shall have rest while 70 years are fulfilled. For those of you who know, remember, I've been teaching Revelation once again, and we're going to be doing that at the top of the hour as well. We'll be picking right back up. Uh, so Jeremiah talks about uh, the land Sabbaths. Remember Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12. This is a reflection on the evil of not listening to God's prophets. And it culminates in a declaration that the exile would last 70 years. And moreover, it's a punishment for neglecting the Sabbath law of Leviticus chapter 25, verse 4. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Verse 22 says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, by the way, Isaiah chapter 44, verse uh, 28, calls him the shepherd of Yahweh, who will accomplish Yahweh's will and gives him the grandiose title of the anointed of Yahweh, who grasp his right hand a title which was earlier reserved to Jewish kings and priests, by the way. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people. Thank you. Well, that's a, oh, that's a beautiful, Missy. Sorry, I'm so distracted that there's a beautiful whale there. So. Um, he has given, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. So, in 538 B.C., Cyrus permitted the Jews residing in Babylon to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and its temple. The text of Cyrus's decree is actually quoted in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. So Cyrus had a policy of restoring the images of captured gods and their original temples, which, which he often rebuilt. Since the Jews had no sacred images, he restored to them the sacred vessels of the temple, which had been looted by Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you, Gail. My goodness gracious, Gail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I, I, you know, I don't know if I should keep um, Instagram. I've been wanting, thinking about going back to um, Clapper.
a lot of people have told me about Clapper. You should you know, go back to Clapper and, re and build, that, uh, build that little community. But I don't know. Uh, I just don't seem to get a lot of traction in uh, Instagram. I don't. For those of you who are wondering, there's, um, again, there's talk. Thank you. There's talk, once again, of uh, TikTok being possibly banned. Uh, in the United States, and they have a law now, or they're they're trying to pass. It's in Congress, it's in the Senate. I'm sorry. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. But people keep telling me, you know, maybe I should go back, go to Clapper. I've been to Clapper once, and um, so I don't know. I did okay in Clapper. Uh, for those of you on on Instagram, I'm going to close out here. Yeah, Instagram, I just. Um, I just don't do well on Instagram at all. I just don't. Uh, Clapper may be a better option because I, I was kind of building a little bit of it. Uh, we we were building a, a, a good community there. And so I, I might, uh, Jason, I might do that. Let me see if I'm. Yeah, because people keep telling me I should go back to, to Clapper and. Well, the problem is you, I don't like the fact that you can't expand the video. Yeah, I'm going to probably go back to Clapper because it, it was it was not bad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. I got it. Sorry, everybody. I just want to. I'm going to try it. We'll see if we'll see if it's better. We'll see. Uh, Clapper is a, um, it's an alternative to, uh, to uh, TikTok. And so we'll, we'll go back to, we'll, we'll go back to Clapper. I'm on Clapper. All right. Our second reading, everybody. Uh, second is Ephesians chapter two, verse four through 10. So Ephesians chapter, chapter two, verses four through 10. Yeah. For those of you on uh, Clapper, I'm not, uh, I'm not usually on here, but we'll, we'll start running it on Clapper from now on as well on TikTok. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 10. This is our Bible study tonight. So let's get into it, everybody. It says here, but God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ by grace, you have been saved, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens of in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not from you. It is a gift of God. It is not from works, no, so that no one may boast. Uh, for we are his handiwork, Christ, uh, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that has, God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. And if we were mass, we'd say the word of the Lord. Okay. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been on uh, on uh, Clapper, so I think we'll, we'll bring that back. Well, thank you very much. All right, let me, uh, since the second century, this letter has been attributed to St. Paul, although it was not unknown at that time to attribute authorship to a famous person. Ephesus was a large seaport city. On, a, uh, on the western coast of Asia Minor and the capital city of the Roman province of Asia. And St. Paul stayed at Ephesus during his second missionary journey uh, and made it its, his base during his third missionary journey, spending about three years there. Now, in the first three chapters of this letter, which that's, well, thank you, uh, which is from our reading for today, it announces God's great plan hidden from the beginning of the word of, of the world uh, to create a messianic people of God, a new community of people uniting in, in Christ, both in, in Jew and Gentile, erasing the this social religious barriers that had previously divided uh, mankind. And it is St. Paul's privilege to be chosen, the chosen herald of God, appointed to reveal to us the mystery of God's love, according to that's what Paul said. Well, thank you very much, Eddie. I'm glad to be back. I haven't been for I haven't been here for a while, and I'm going to start coming back. I'm going to start coming back on on Clapper. Verse four says, "But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love He had for us." By the way, the word "rich" is 
really misinterpreted by people who like prosperity gospel because they say, see, St. Paul is even talking about rich. No, no, son. No, he was not talking about that rich. It's used five times in Ephesus. This stresses the abundance of God's mercy. Verse five, even when we uh, were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So rather than saved, this might be better translated as made alive or, or brought to life. Uh, the subject here is we're talking about spiritual dread, that's spiritual death, rather than physical death, as in the story of the prodigal son. Uh, salvation is a lifelong process, the result of which we learn only at our judgment. It says, raised us, uh, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. There are three verbs used in, uh, in this discourse. Brought to life, saved, raised, and seated, which basically means enthroned. So we're talking about brought to life, raised, and seated. Uh, thank you, Missy. Uh, this is a parallel with Jesus' own actions in the resurrection and ascension and forcibly brings the, the intimate association of a Christian with Christ. Okay, uh, verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Oh, well, hello there, Aiden. Okay, so by, by the way, now this is misinterpreted. A lot of people say, aha, that proves right there that we are saved by faith alone. Nope, that's not what Paul is saying. This is not a faith alone theology. For Paul, faith is not just believing. It is living out that faith. So your actions must echo the statement, I am a Christian. You cannot call yourself a Christian and then judge and condemn other people. We don't, we don't earn our way to heaven. You can't earn your way to heaven. It's not a paycheck. That is work righteousness. That's a heresy. Uh, but if we don't live our, our faith, then we can't attain salvation. So that's what that's what we're talking about with works. People get confused. So, you know, faith without works is dead. Well, you can't earn your way. I agree. You can't earn your but you, at the same time, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then your, your actions should display that. OK, and this is and this is not from you. It's a gift of God. So faith is a gift. It's freely given. But it is accepted by us at the price of surrendering of self. So you can't say, oh, I have faith in God in these circumstances. See, uh, St. Jerome said this. It really was well said. Paul says, this is uh, in case the secret thought should steal upon us that if we are not saved by our own works, at least we are saved by our own faith. And so another way of our salvation is our, of ourselves. Thus, he added the statement that faith, is too, faith too is not in our own will, but it's also God's gift. Not that he means to take away free choice from humanity, but that even this very freedom of choice has God as its author. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. It is not, um, uh, it is not from works. So no one may boast, for we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live, them, live in them. So in other words, we don't earn our way into heaven. You can't earn your way into heaven. It's not a paycheck. It's not like going, you know, doing your 40 hours a week. See, and once we believe, we don't get a free ride either. Let's make that clear. We must live out our faith all the days of our life. We don't live out our faith because we want to, but because the grace provided by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit persuades us to. Remember, James says, oh, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. That's really pretty. Uh, James said, faith without works is dead. So we have to, again, when we make the statement uh, that I'm a Christian, you don't 
earn heaven. You don't do good things to say, hey, God, look at me. Look, look, look over here. You know, it's not a teacher's pet kind of situation. You do good works because you're drawn to do good works. Because as a, as a Christian, you, are, you should be naturally drawn to that. But you can't say that I'm a Christian. And yet, again, we talked earlier, going to this denomination that may, let's say this denomination is the Lutherans. Well, you're not this, so you're not going to go to heaven. Uh, yeah, a lot of that goes on today. A lot of that goes on. You're not to this denomination, so you won't enter heaven. Now, you know what? That's elitism. That actually falls into Gnosticism. We got to be careful about that. You know, if you're if you're a Lutheran, fine. If you're old Catholic, fine. If you're Roman Catholic, fine. If you're Episcopalian, fine. Baptist, fine. The point is, we all believe the same thing: Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. So this, thank you, Robert. So this idea that you have to be a certain denomination in order to go to heaven is not biblical at all. Jesus did not say, unless you are Roman Catholic, you will not enter into heaven. That's not what Jesus never said that. Unless you are Baptist or unless you're Lutheran or Episcopal, he never said this. That is man's rules. That is an elitism type of theology, and I reject that completely. I reject it completely. Okay. Um, okay, let's get into our gospel. So our gospel reading right now is John chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. Yep, John chapter 3, verses uh, 14 through 21. Yeah, I need to make sure, uh, Jax, that you are still a moderate. Oh, I think that's what, let me see if I missed this. I'll make a moderate. Oh, I got to confirm that. Yeah, there we go. There you go, Jax. Okay. I, I just, the only thing I don't like about this clapper is I can't expand my screen. See that? And it cuts that off right there. I don't like that. And you can actually, sorry, you guys have no idea what I'm pointing to. That's the only thing I don't like. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. Let's go. Now, Jesus answered and said to them, You are the teacher of Israel, and you do not understand this. Amen, amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I tell you about earthly things, and you don't believe them, then how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the son of man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the son of man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone, everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the Holy Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their, their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. And if we were at Mass, we'd see the Gospel of the Lord. It's a beautiful, this is a truly uh, powerful reading, isn't it? Uh, this part of the Gospel, by the way, is a familiar one. So uh, for those, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, uh, the name means conqueror of the people. He was a Pharisee, and he's called a ruler of the Jews in John chapter 3, verse 1 which probably means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And he visited Jesus at night. He admitted his divine mission. So our reading today is part of Jesus' discourse on baptism. And Jesus has told Nicodemus that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Uh, by the way, the, 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 the name here it also means from above a statement which confuses Nicodemus, which understand, understandably so, because Nicodemus says, well, how can one be born again? I, you're born once. And that allows Jesus to explain the significance of his mission. So that's why, that is why I started uh, our reading in verse 10. 
instead of 14. So that's why you're like, well, how do you start? So now you understand why I did that. So in verse 10 says, and Jesus answered and said to him, you are the teacher of Israel and you do not understand this. Amen. Amen. I say to you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you people don't accept our testimony. That's the testimony to which Jesus refers to his testimony and that of John the Baptist. That's what he's saying. Verse 12, if I tell you about earthly things and you do not believe them, then how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Uh, it, it, it's really, this is a very powerful statement. And, and by the way, Jesus is again, once again, he's clearly establishing that he's God. Because if Jesus is going to teach you about earthly things, which a human can do, but Jesus goes even further and says, not only will I teach you about earthly things, I will teach you about heavenly things. And the only being that can teach you about heavenly things is not man, but God. So once again, Jesus is making it very clear that he's God. Uh, no one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man, which, by the way, Jesus referred to him many times as the Son of Man. The Son of Man does not mean the Son of a human being. The Son of Man was known as the Messiah. So Jesus referred to himself many times as the Son of Man. So he says, no one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. By the way, this refers to Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 through 9, where Moses set up the bronze serpent on a pole to cure all who had been bitten by the seraph serpents. In Wisdom chapter 16, verse 6, the bronze serpent is called the sign of salvation, being lifted up, has a, a double significance when applied to Christ. Okay, and then it says, uh, 15, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Look, here, here's the deal. Jesus says this. Again, everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, we got to stop this, well, uh, this, this idea that we have the authority to determine who has eternal life and who does not. Because that's not scripture. Jesus makes it very clear. If you believe in him and you you absolutely accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, you're good. That's it. You'll have eternal life. So this idea, well, you're not Roman Catholic. You're not this Catholic. You're not that Catholic. You're not Methodist. You're not. That stuff's got to stop. That stuff is so ridiculous. It says for 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Uh, thank you very much, Gail. Thank you. And thank you, Mommy. Um, this familiar sign which we see held up uh, in the end zone of football games, John, John 3, 16. Although alienated from God, the world is not evil in of itself. It remains the object of divine compassion. Anybody who teaches that the world is evil and the spiritual is good and only the spiritual good is teaching you heresy. That's Gnosticism. That is heresy. That is heresy. That is absolutely heretical. That is not scriptural. I'm going to say this again. There's a lot of people out there teaching. The, the world is evil. It's all evil. The material is all evil. The body is all evil. Only the spirit is good. That is not biblical. That is heretical. That is Gnosticism. Gnosticism is heresy. God created the world. God created us. For us then to turn around and say God's creation is evil is calling God evil. It is heretical. Stay away from anybody who teaches you that. So I'm, I'm, I don't care who they are. Now, what we do in this world, certainly, yeah, our actions can cause it evil, but the world in of itself is quite beautiful. It is absolutely stunning. Some of these, some, uh, sometimes I'll do uh, videos on TikTok, on, uh, and I do the, the beautiful, gorgeous, I mean, just beautiful sceneries of the world. So anybody who teaches that, they are not teaching you scripture. They're teaching you Gnosticism. Now, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Look, here's the deal. Look, guys, here's the deal. There are only two choices here. There are two choices. You believe in Jesus, have eternal life, or you reject, and you don't have eternal life. There's no middle ground. 
And I'm sorry. There's a lot of people. I, I just, I, I can't tell you. I, I cannot tell you that. Oh, you don't have to believe in Jesus. The Bible is very clear. You have the choice to make. Um, thank you there, Tick Tiger. Uh, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned. Thank you, Missy. But whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the Holy Son of God. By the way, the name is being uh, is a being of a person in Jewish theology. If you believe in the name, then you believe in all that all the person represents. So the name Jesus means God saves. And Christ was sent into the world to bring eternal life. Willful unbelief makes him the occasion of condemnation and the unbeliever passes judgment upon himself. That's what they're saying. So he who does not believe has already been condemned, according to scripture. Not Bishop Long. People get upset when I say this. Look, my job is to teach scripture. I, I, my job is not to uh, insert misinterpretation into scripture. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to mislead you. If scripture says this is what it says, and that's what it says. Jesus made it very clear. So if Jesus said it, I listen to it. And this is the verdict, 19, that the light came into the world, but people prefer darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things, hates the light, does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. You know, there's a lot of people, uh, especially on, on social media, that loves to attack other people, that likes to try to destroy other people's credibility. That is the work of Satan. That is, you, there's no justification in doing that. That is the work of Satan. You know, the evildoer is the child of darkness and will not come to the light, which is Christ. He who approaches the light, on the other hand, is the one who lives the truth. To live the truth is an Old Testament expression, which means to keep the faith. And faith brings us out of darkness and into the light. And it sets us on the road of salvation. Uh, he who does the works of, of, um, that are of God comes to the light. Let me tell you, uh, and, I, and this is your true statement. A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't go around trolling people. A person who is truly filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't go around trying to diminish someone else's credibility, perhaps maybe because they're of a different denomination than they are. That's a different spirit. And we have to be very, very careful not to ever fall into the temptation of doing that. Whether a person has dementia or lacks mental uh, capacity and don't understand, oh, yeah, well, that's different. I mean, that says, what if a person has dementia or lacks mental capacity? and don't understand of believing Jesus would have mercy to him. No, 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 that's completely different because that person is not in the right state, not in the right mind. So you have to look at the intent and they're not in full awareness of their mental faculties. So in that situation, it'd be completely different. The same way, you know, even if a person passes away, I've never heard of Jesus at all, ever. Well, that's a different, I believe that I, in my personal belief, and this is my personal belief, I believe that, we, well, I know that we have a loving God, a compassionate God, and I believe that if those people are pass away, when those people pass away, it is my hope that they are shown the truth and that they accept the truth. Now for those, especially for those people who've never heard of Christ. But I think if, if you have been, uh, if someone has said, hey, this is the truth, this is what it is, and you're like, absolutely no, I'm going to reject it, have nothing, well, they don't, that person is in their full faculties. So, but it's always my hope that somehow, call it purgatory, call it whatever term you want to call out, I'm hoping that if a person has rejected God all their life, I, I, I hope, you know, I pray for that person. I can't say if that person is in heaven or hell because that's not my place to say. But I, I, it's my, it certainly is my place to say I hope that there is some form of, okay, here's the truth. Now, do you, you can accept it or not accept it. I, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I either some people say, nope, that's it. You know, once you pass away, that's all over. Uh, thank you, Missy. Thank you. Uh, but that's just my my per I guess that's my personal optimism, optimistic view, you know.
Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for being here. And uh, I, I do appreciate all of you. And I appreciate all of you on on um, a brand new, we're going to come, we're going to stay with uh, uh, Clapper. I promise you, we're going to, we're going to continue running Clapper from now on. And uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and of course, Spreaker and uh, TikTok. And again, for those of you who are offering gifts to the ministry on TikTok, thank you for that. For those of you who are liking uh, the, the, the video, we have 70, almost 79,000 likes right there on TikTok. So I appreciate those of you who subscribed to the channel. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, Connie, I tell you what, I, I completely understand that. I do. A and here's the deal. Uh, any any church that would reject you, then you need to reject them. Uh, because uh, it is it is irresponsible for anybody to reject you. They should the, the church community is supposed to love and welcome you. Everyone should be welcome into God's house. Uh, so, uh, I, and there's a lot of people who don't go to church uh, because of what a pastor told them once. I, I've talked to this. I've told this story once before, several times before. But I was at a conference one time doing a presentation. They asked me to do a, a Sunday mass, and I said okay. And there was an individual there. It was it was time for uh, communion. And the music was playing, so no one heard anything. And 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 when people come up to receive communion, they either receive it or they cross their arms like this, which means that they can't receive for for a variety of reasons. Either they haven't received the first communion, or they're they're in whatever it might be in their consciousness they can't receive. And so I asked this gentleman, I said, "Would you like to receive communion?" And no one heard our conversation. He said, "I can't." I said, well, "Why not?" And he said, "Because the pastor said uh, ten years ago, or fifteen. I've, it was fifteen years. It was ten, fifteen years ago." Uh, that his wife had divorced him because she cheated on him. She committed adultery and she cheated on him and that she, they had a, they had a, um, uh, a divorce. And so the church required him to, uh, to get an annulment and he didn't want to do that because he had kids. And so he said, he can't do that. And so the priest said, well, you have no business ever uh, receiving communion again. And I think it was like 15 years. And I looked at him and, and he was getting his, I said, so you have not received communion in 15 years? He said, no. And he started, his eyes started swelling up with tears. And then I said, would you like to receive communion today? And he said, yes. And he started shaking and he, he held out his hands. I can, he was trembling, he was shaking. And I distributed communion to him and he just cried. The man, he just sobbed. So I had to, you know, stop liturgy and give him a hug and just kind of let him know it's going to be okay. And, and, I, and later on, I was thinking, People in the in the audience were probably thinking, "What did Bishop Long say to that poor guy?" But that was a powerful moment. It was a very powerful moment, and it, it reminded me that you know, there's a lot of people who've turned away from church because of what man man's rules. And so, uh, this, I mean, this is our this is our kind of a church community that we've built here. You don't have to go to a church building. Uh, this is our this is a church community that we have built. All right, Revelations, everybody. Let's get into it because we got a lot to cover. So, yeah, I'll do my homily on Sunday. So, by the way, I'm going to be here Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard, and I will be on the Clapper Friday. And then um, Saturday is our open mic night. Oh, Saturday. I have a very special, very, very special show. And I think it's important for me to say this. I, okay. I don't, I don't understand what it's like to be transgendered, obviously, because I am what they call cisgender. I was born in a male body and I identify as, as a male. So that's what they call that cisgender male. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm learning all of this. I'm trying to learn it. And so this Saturday... I have asked a surgeon who uh, is very supportive of transgendered individuals who does perform surgery to come on on Saturday and talk to us about this. Because I, I will admit my, my education is limited and I don't want to uh, I don't want to find my information through social media. I'm sorry, I just don't. 
I would rather find it from a credible source, from a doctor's perspective. So I'm truly grateful that he was willing to do so. I mean, he's a surgeon. So this is, uh, this was, I think, pretty special. So this uh, Saturday, after Miss Wilma and I, we goof off from 8 to 8.30, around 8.35, he's going to be calling in live. And uh, he does have a TikTok channel. I'll let you guys know what his TikTok channel is. And so he's going to be talking about transgendered individuals, why he feels it necessary to do this type of surgery. Um, and we're going to get it directly from him, from a doctor, instead of online. So uh, I ask that, you know, if you're interested, if you want to learn more, you may not dis you may disagree with it completely. Fine. But at least we can learn together because I'll be learning, too. So uh, it's going to be a real interesting uh, situation. I will be putting it on um, uh, Facebook. If you have any, if you want questions that you want me to ask him, then put it on the comments. I'll be doing that uh, later on. Uh, TikTok, I'll be making a video as well. I think I'll try to do it on Clapper as well. Uh, and so you guys can put comments in, you know, what questions you want me to ask him? Because, you know, we're, 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 I'm trying to learn, you know, I'm trying to learn. Um, is it a sin for people to electively modify their bodies? I, I see, and that's the problem right there, isn't it? Because the question is when you uh, electively modify, it, it, it implies that it's not a necessity. But people that I've spoken to about this topic says it absolutely is a necessity. It's not like getting Botox you know, to make your lips prettier or fuller. I don't know what they, what, why they do it. But anyway, so I, I will, um, well, yeah, face look like a facelift is modifying. I don't think it's a sin. I mean, I, but I, I think um, we'll talk about that. We'll 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 discuss and uh, have a conversation. So, oh, you're right, Michelle. You're right. Yeah, but, yeah Michelle, surgeons are human, but they understand it from a different. I want it. I want it from a scientific perspective. That's what I'm looking for, from a scientific perspective, asking questions. Uh, and I think it's important. And then, and then again, you, you may, uh, you may listen to him and say, Nope, I still disagree. Okay. Uh, or you may say, well, I never thought of that, but it's all about education, just like atheism or, or just even Satanism. I've read the satanic Bible. I know what's in it. And I, the reason is I read the satanic Bible is so that I can teach you, this is what's in it. And because it's, it's very important as, as a, a, a you know, theologian that i I've read the book of Enoch, you know, and so it's, it's very important for me to, why, why does he keep doing that? Oh, for heaven's sakes. It keeps the very, I don't know. It did it again on, on TikTok. It said, your live is going to end if you don't put this puzzle thing together. Okay. All right. Let's get into a uh, revelation. I know it. Yeah. It keeps telling me that uh, on uh, TikTok. Uh, it did it last time. Say so your live will end if you don't verify. Okay, there's a little puzzle. So uh, as we usually do, uh, everybody, uh, we rejoin our study with a short preview of the, of the big picture. Okay, so we're entering into part three, the things that happen after the church. And in that time, we're studying the 70th seven of Daniel, which we learned the last time is also known as the day of the Lord. And it's a period designed for Israel's troubles as a response to breaking the old covenant. So its purpose is to bring Israel back to obedience and holiness as they enter the kingdom. And we can clearly see how the Lord uses that period for the benefit of his people in a couple of chapters in Leviticus. See, chapter 25 says that Israel must observe a land Sabbath every seven, uh, seventh year. And it also says that those who are dis, uh, dispossessed of their land must have that inheritance restored after 49 years. So then in chapter 26, we find penalties for those who violate these laws. If Israel fails to keep the land Sabbath, they will, put, they will be put outside the land for, seven, for 70 years. It's a penalty of 10 times. And this was the last time Israel spent in Babylon. And so for uh, Israel's failure to keep the covenant, they will be oppressed in many ways and put outside the land as well. Now, Daniel 9, remember, tells us that those penalties will last 77s. It equals to 490 years. 
But then at the end of that 490 years, the people will receive back their land as their inheritance. Uh, and that's the age of the Gentiles. And then, of course, the final seven years will be the day of the Lord and the worst period of all. So the entire period of history, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar and ending with Jesus' return, is focuses on Israel's judgment. And it comes in these two chunks, as laid out in Leviticus and Daniel, the last of uh, which is the seven-year tribulation. So this is why I teach this, because, I, again, I look at, I look at Revelation as prophetic. Now, let's put this moment in perspective. Chapters 1 and 3 in Revelation, it covered the church period, which itself is part of the larger period of Daniel called the Age of the Gentiles, which we are in. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 explain how we leave the times that are and enter into the things that follow. And it began last week with our study of chapter 4. Remember, John witnessed the throne room of God. And from the, uh, the clues that we were given, we concluded that the promised removal of the church from earth had taken place. So, the church at this time was present in heaven. Heaven received new bodies in the resurrection and their heavenly rewards. And that was the coming of the Lord for the church as promised in John 14. It's an event. It's markedly different than the second coming of Christ in that the flows of events is in the opposite direction. So people always talk about the rapture. And I understand people don't like the term. They say it's a Protestant term. I've already explained that on Sunday. Uh, we have come to, some many people have come to call it the rapture, but whatever you want to call it, we know it can happen at any time. Please understand that we are currently living in that time. Revelation is very clear that the church age, the age of the Gentiles will end. That's the rapture or caught up, whatever term you want to call it. And then the second coming will occur. Those are two separate events. So people are always asking me, do I believe in the second coming will happen? Yeah, but first, according to Revelation, the church age must end, which means that those who are currently within the church and believers were in heaven. So we see the second coming in heaven. We will not see the second coming if you're a believer in Christ on earth. And that's what Revelation says. And that's what I believe. Uh, it's, uh, so this, this uh, rapture, if you will, it's not connected to any other event in history, except that Paul told us that it must happen prior to the second coming. And that wrath will come upon the whole earth, Paul said, yet it won't come upon the church. Why? Because the church is in heaven. And as we said, the only way something can come upon the whole earth, yet not impact the church, is if we're gone. So therefore, chapter 4 is given to us in the book of Revelation to make it clear that the things that are have ended. The church is no longer, having been removed into heaven at the coming of the Lord. And that is, again, I take the Bible, I, I, and, I, and people say, well, I don't understand. Well, then go back and watch, because I'm not, I'm not reteaching this again next year or this year. This is it, because this is the third year in the row that I've taught it. And people are always asking me about the rapture and the second coming. It's like, folks, uh, this is a third year. And it takes six months to teach this. So that's what I believe. Uh, and, and I've also used other biblical references to explain why. But here again, the things that uh, uh, the things after the church are themselves still a part of the age of the Gentiles. So, um, so there are uh, no believers of Christ on earth when he returns. That's correct. The church is gone. The age continues until Jesus returns the earth. So if we jump ahead to chapter 19 of Revelation, we find a description of Jesus' physical return to earth. So Revelation 19 gives us the end point of the age of Gentiles within this book. Or, or perhaps maybe they're people who claim to be followers of Christ, but they're working actually for the devil. Uh, because remember, St. James said, faith without works is dead. And Jesus even talks about, he despises people who have lukewarm faith. It says in Revelation, he will vomit them out of his mouth. So the process of elimination, chapters 6 through 19, it describes events after the church has departed. Okay? So this is how you need to understand, this is how I interpret Revelation. 
chapters 6 through 19 that we're going to read now, it, describe, it, it describes events, well, later on, it describes events after the church has departed. So we're gone. Uh, and that's but before the Lord's return, the second coming. And that's the next period of our study, the study of the events that uh, that in the church age, uh, which is the, 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 the day of the Lord. It's a time of wrath. So let's take a brief look at the end of chapter four. We're going to move into chapter five. Uh, Revelation chapter four, verse five says out from the throne room, uh, out from the throne comes flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front of behind. The first creature was like a lion and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Now, we read uh, these verses uh, on the Sunday that uh, though we didn't really time, we didn't really spend a whole lot of time on them in detail. So for our purposes tonight, we're going to focus on one interesting connection to the book of Ezekiel. The four creatures around the throne room are cherubim. That's the highest class of angelic beings. Cherubims are guardian angels. Or they're guardians of the glory of God. And the last time we saw them was mentioned in the Bible was Ezekiel chapter 10. They're not little chubby, fat, little chubby babies with chubby cheeks. They're actually, when you, just, when you look at them, it's like, wow, that's an interesting description. In that chapter, these guardians arrive in Jerusalem to escort the glory of God out of his temple in advance of the coming of the Babylonian attack. And when the glory of God departed the temple, it was the last time God dwelt among his people, Israel. His glory had not been present on earth with Israel since the, that day, apart from Jesus appearing on the, on the, in his day. So now we see them mentioned again, and they are still at God's side, guarding his glory. Interestingly, uh, uh, Ezekiel 10 takes place at the point when the age of the Gentiles is, is, is beginning, just as Nebuchadnezzar arrives at Jerusalem. So the Lord sent Babylon to attack so that Israel would fall and the age of Gentiles would begin. He foreshadowed that coming destruction by removing his glory from the temple shortly before the armies arrived. So now in chapter four, we enter into the final seven years of events that will bring the age to an end and allow the glory of God to return to a new temple. So just as the cherubim were used in Ezekiel to foreshadow the departure of God's glory from dwelling with a disobedient Israel, now they are shown again to foreshadow the return of God's glory to his temple to dwell among an obedient Israel. But notice the phrase they use in their worship of God. He is the one who is to come, meaning to come into his kingdom and glory. So this chapter is the preamble to the rest of Revelation, which tells the story of how the glory of God will return to earth and to Israel. But before that can happen, much will take place on earth and in heaven, including much wrath. So that's where we're going to go next, to the beginning of the wrath of God on earth during the final seven years of this age. And that story opens in chapter five. So again, for those of you who are worried, for those of you who are stressed, for those of you who are full of anxiety, you and me, we are in heaven at this time. Okay? So we, the church will be caught up first. Call it the rapture, call it caught up, call it whatever you want. So people say the rapture is not biblical. Well, again, I've already explained this. I'm not going to keep repeating it 500 times. It's very clear in scripture. So whatever term you want to call it, the end of the church age happens. Then the wrath occurs. Revelation 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, 
The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living, living creatures and the elders a lamp standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Powerful. That's a lot of stuff in there. So obviously chapter 5 continues the scene begun in chapter 4. So we still have John. He's still in the throne room of God. And the Father is on the throne, as before, with the elders and four living creatures present. And we can assume the seven spirits of God are also present, obviously. And now we see a new character, the Lamb. So is there any doubt? I think if there was any doubt to his identity, he's also called the Lion of Judah and the Root of David. So obviously, that's Christ. And although Jesus was always there, only now does John mention him. So all three persons of the Trinity are present in the scene. But from this point forward in the book of Revelation, all focus remains on Christ alone. So the chapter opens with the Father on the throne holding a book. Uh, the Greek word uh, for book is a biblion. And in John's day, a biblion was not a bound volume of pages like books are today. A biblion was a scroll, a rolled up parchment. And uh, typically, important scrolls, like legal documents, would be sealed where the edge of the uh, rolled scroll, uh, uh, scroll ends. And the scroll would be sealed shut with wax seals. In this case, we're told the uh, scroll was affixed with seven such seals. And the number seven remains 100%. So this is a complete sealing of the scroll. No one has opened it or knows its contents. So what is the scroll? Well, the only clue we that uh, the only clue that we have is, is or it's found is in the description John gives us. And John says it has writing on both sides and in that day scrolls were usually written on one side only. Only certain legal documents were required to have writing on both the inside and and the outside of the rolled up parchment. In particular, this is what's really interesting. Listen to this. Land deeds were often uh, annotated in this way. So when land was sold or awarded in Israel, a deed would be drawn up describing the land and the terms of the sale or the use of the land. And those details were written inside the document and the scroll was sealed. But any transfer of property within Israel was temporary at best. So the law required land to revert to its original owner of the at the Jubilee time. So in the meantime, a land deed granted a transfer of the land for a time according to the terms of the deed. So the deed scroll was sealed to ensure that no one could tamper with the document or, or change the terms of the agreement. And a summary of the terms of the deed were written on the outside of the scroll so that others could know what was, what was agreed. And if there was any doubt raised over the authenticity of the summary, the seals could be broken by a magistrate 
Now, and then the full deed could be inspected to verify the terms of the sale or transfer. However, once the seals were broken on the deed, it was considered complete or finished, brought to an end. So in the event that seals were broken for any reason, the deed ends and a new agreement must be struck. Since the scrolls is said to contain writing on both sides with what we know about Revelation overall, it's reasonable to conclude that this is a land deed. Isn't that amazing? See, when you learn the history and it's like, well, what is this land? What is this scroll? It's a land deed, which leads us to ask a land deed for what? The obvious answer is for the land of Israel. See, in 605 BC, and this is what's this is really interesting. In 605 BC, the Lord set Israel outside their land and under Gentile oppression. Thank you for subscribing. Moreover, he gave their land over to Gentiles to trample it to varying degrees for the past 2,600 years and counting. Now, this period of history, the age of the Gentiles, is a time when the land of Israel has been deeded, so to speak, to Gentiles. But a time is coming when the Lord ends that land deed and returns the land to its rightful owner, Israel. But as God promised Israel back when he began this age, listen to this, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 6, therefore says, therefore say, thus says the Lord God, though I had removed them from far away, the nations, and though I had scattered them among the countries, yet I was a sanctuary for them a little while in the countries where they had gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, they will remove all its detestable things and all its abominations from it. And I will give them one heart and put in a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a new heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people and I shall be their God. Okay. But breaking uh, the seals on a land deed was reserved for a magistrate or a judge with authority over the land. See, in past times, it would be a local leader with authority over an area within Israel. But who has authority over the whole of Israel and all the land promised to God's people? Well, John, here's a strong angel in the throne room asking the same question in verse 2. Who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? To put it another way, who is able to end the age of the Gentiles, return Israel's land to the rightful owners? And at first, the answer is that no one was found. Notice no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. So now, at first, it, that seems hard to believe since the Father is in heaven. Surely he's worthy. But the term worthy does not mean good enough. It means appropriate or deserved. Remember, God the Father gave Israel's land to the Gentiles in the first place. And therefore, the Father couldn't break the seals because to do so obviously means that he would be breaking his own word in that agreement. So we need someone authorized to judge the matter rightfully, someone authorized to inspect the terms of the agreement. And once the agreement is inspected, it comes to an end. Now, and in its place, a new agreement must be struck, one that establishes a very different arrangement with the land. So initially, John is told that no one is able to judge an agreement established by God the Father. And John is moved to tears because it means that the land of Israel will never again return to Israel. So, well, so it seemed to him. But there is one who could rightly judge an agreement established by God and that would be our mediator. See, if God were to take human form, he could rightly judge his own agreement with humanity, for he could represent both sides. Well, this is pretty interesting. Now it's getting interesting. Why did God become human? It goes much more than destroying sin and death. Again, if God were to take human form, he could right, rightly judge his own agreement with humanity, because he could represent both sides. And notice that in verse 5 and 6, John is told by one of the human elders in heaven, 
that the lamb has overcome so as to open the scroll. In verse 6, Jesus is described as a lamb standing as if slain. It's a powerful statement, standing as if slain. It's, it's, it's an idiom, a figure of speech in Greek, meaning back from the dead, or we would say resurrected. So John describes Jesus as a resurrected lamb of God. Furthermore, Jesus has seven horns, seven eyes. Why, why is that important? The text tells us these details represents the spirit of God sent out into all earth is all seeing and all ruling. Perfect. And that detail suggests that the Spirit of God has returned to the earth to resume his ministry after having removed the church. Then John is told Jesus is worthy to open the scroll because he is, he has overcome. To overcome uh, means to have been victorious over something. And Jesus himself tells us what he gains victory over. So we don't have to guess. In John chapter 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you. Thank you there, Sheena. These things I have spoken to you so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So he, over, he, over, uh, he overcame the world, which is a way of saying he defeated the ruler of the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 14, I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So Jesus has overcome the devil, and we know how he did this. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. So Jesus' death and resurrection overcomes the enemy's dominion over the earth. And in doing so, Jesus took away the enemy's only weapon against us, which is what? Death. And Jesus rendered death null and void. And in that way, Jesus has become qualified or worthy to judge the world. Acts chapter 10, verse 42 says, and he ordered us to preach to the people, solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. So the father's deed, uh, the father's uh, deeded over Israel's land to the enemy and the Gentiles world for a time. And now the judge of the world has authority to inspect that deed. So by his death and resurrection, Jesus is worthy to play mediator between God and man and to judge. So Jesus comes to the father in verse seven, removes the book from the father's hand. Now we get the sense of authority being transferred from the father to the son. Therefore, the events that follow are the same moments of Christ exercising his authority to judge the world. And in particular, to open the land deed for Israel, to render it void and finished. And he does so. The land will revert to its original owner, which is God, who eventually will award that land to Israel as he promised to Abraham that he would do. But this scroll has seven seals. So opening it, it's a process. It's, um, it's not a moment. And as Jesus opens each, seal, uh, each scroll in heaven, certain events will play out on earth. And that will be the pattern of chapter 6 through 19. Events in heaven triggers events on earth. And it all starts with Jesus opening the scroll. See, in verse 8 through 10, the cherubim around the throne break out in a song of praise accompanied by musical instruments and, and bowls of incense. Besides confirming the Lord approves of musical instruments, by the way, in worship, it demonstrates how we participate in praise of God even now. See, the bowls contain uh, the prayers of the saints, which have risen before the throne of God and are part of worship. So our prayers literally become content to the worship of God in heaven. And the song they sang confirms that Christ's authority to take back the world and Israel from the enemy is based on his sacrificial death. So when you start getting into uh, Jesus' death and res resurrection, now you're getting into the deep theological reasoning behind his crucifixion and resurrection. Instead of your typical, uh, he died destroying sin and death, gaining us eternal life. Okay, but there's a lot more to it. And now you can understand why. 
Okay. Uh, and by the way, I mean, this, this, his sacrificial death, he purchased with his blood many peoples and nations, and together they have become a kingdom and priest for God. And the song alludes to where these events are headed, to the establishment of the kingdom in place of earthly kingdoms. We are the citizens of that future kingdom. So in God's economy, he created the citizens of the kingdom before he established it physically on earth. And he made us to be priests in preparation for the kingdom's arrival. We are intercessors who bring a knowledge of God to the world, you and me. And by the way, the Revelation says ultimately we will reign upon the earth with Christ. And finally, the scene ends with an incredible moment of praise for God. See, John looks up to see that throne room was actually filled with an un uh, uncountable number of angels and the rest. And together they are all worshiping the lamb at the moment of his coming into his kingdom. And notice this praise rings out from everything in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, in the sea, every living thing, including those in the sea and even the dead unbelievers in hell. Paul told us in Philippians that this is the destiny for all creation. And Revelation 5 tells us it comes to pass at the dawn of the kingdom. So as the final seven years of Daniel's 77s begin, the creation is put on notice that Jesus is to be praised. And yet, obviously, those on earth praising Jesus aren't universally converted. And those in hell aren't saved. Because when Jesus' worthiness to receive praise is self-evident, it won't be based on faith. So in the next chapter, Jesus will begin breaking the seals. And with each one, the world convulses in expectation of the coming in of the age. John is going to witness that process from heaven and then report what happens on each as a result. And that process will continue throughout all throughout chapters 6 through 19. And by this pattern, we come to understand that Jesus is the direct cause of the events on earth. He is exercising his authority from heaven in preparation for his return to earth, where he will exercise the authority in person. Chapter 6 can be frustrating sometimes for Bible students because it describes the opening events of tribulation, and sometimes in a limited detail. It leaves us with many questions concerning the exact nature and meaning of the events that take place. As we've said before, look, the reasons the details aren't given in chapter 6 is because they're elsewhere in Scripture. So we're not going to guess. Revelation is simply making us aware where they fit into the overall program of the end of times. So if we want to know the details, we must consult the earlier Scripture. And we'll take time to do that homework, but both before and during our study of chapter six. But we're going to give, I'm going to give a brief overview of the signs of the times. Specifically, we need to gather as much as we can from outside Revelation concerning how these last seven years are going to play out. And then alarmed with that detail, we can understand Revelation better. So we're going to go to right now uh, Rev Isaiah 2, chapter 12. For the Lord, Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning. Again, everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who's lifted up, that he may be abased. And it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are, that are lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, against uh, every fortified tower, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft. The pride of man will be humbled, and the loftiness of men will be abased. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols will completely vanish. Men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. The holes in the ground kind of sounds like shelters that people are making, bomb shelters. In that day, men will cast away all the, to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship in order to, uh, to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the hills before the terror of the Lord, the splendor of his majesty, when he arises to make the earth tremble, stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils. For why should he be esteemed? So Isaiah is describing a time of terror on earth, directed at all the proud on earth and those who are abased or ungodly. God will make the earth tremble to humble all mankind for their pride, arrogance, and ungodliness. Notice in verse 22, God will stop regarding man, stop allowing breath in his nostrils for why should mankind be esteemed? 
this will be the first this will be the final reckoning for the age of mankind so this is coming it's, this coming time of terror is for the whole earth but it is made necessary because of the old covenant that God gave Israel and and now moving now to a passage we that I mentioned before uh, Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 4 now these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah for thus says the Lord I have heard a sound of terror of dread there is no peace Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it is a time of Jacob's distress. But he will be, he will be saved from it. It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from their neck and I will tear off their bonds. The strangers will no longer make them their slaves. But they shall serve the Lord, their God, and David, their king, whom I will raise up for them. So Jeremiah's passage gives us an excellent overview on the nature of the tribulation. It focuses on Israel. And the time, the coming time for Israel and Judah is a period of terror. It is so bad that it will cause men to rhythm in pain as if men were giving childbirth, holding their loins. It's a unique day. There's none like it. But ultimately, it's a time for Jacob or Israel to experience distress or affliction. God is inflicting this on Israel specifically, though it impacts the whole earth as well. And in, in the ver verse 7, Jeremiah says that in the end, Israel, the nation, will come, will be saved out of it. So this time of trouble ultimately sets Israel free of the yoke of sin and their slavery imposed by God during the age of, in of Gentiles. And in its place, Israel will live free in their kingdom with their king and with David resurrected over them as well. So from these two passages, we already see a consistent pattern of God promising a terrible worldwide calamity. It impacts the whole world, but it's for Israel, and it comes not to destroy Israel, not fully, but to save them. And knowing this, we understand all the more why Paul said that the church was not appointed to experience this coming tribulation. Now, we were not appointed to wrath because someone else was appointed to receive it. Israel because of the covenant they made with God. And when we say Israel, we mean those unbelieving people who will be alive on that future day. See, believing Jews will have been raptured with the church, taken up, caught up, whatever term you want to call it, and will not experience the wrath intended for the rest of the nation. The unbelieving individual is still required to experience God's wrath because the unbelieving person is still bound by the law and to the law. And it's Israel's law that requires this penalty. You say, well, that's not very fair. Well, let's go back to the beginning where it all began. You enter into a covenant with God, you better know that God is always going to fulfill his end of the bargain. A covenant is much more than a promise. It is something that you can't break. Deuteronomy chapter 20, 29, verse 10. You stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and that the alien who's within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and to his oath, which the Lord your God is making with you today, in order that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you, and he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. So at the, at the moment, the nation is standing on the edge of the promised land, having spent their previous 40 years in the desert. So Moses speaks to a new generation of Israel, commands them to obey the covenant that was established between God and their fathers. But to make sure this generation understood the law, Moses repeats it to them all in this moment. And then he asks this new generation of Israel to obey it, which they do. And in verse 10, Moses explains that even as this generation stood in this moment to accept the covenant with God, they represented a nation. In effect, the entire nation of Israel from all time was standing before God in that moment. And in verse 14 through 15, God says this covenant will apply not only for those standing in that day, but for all future generations. Even those Jews who were not yet born were bound to that covenant. 
so that literally every single Jew who has ever been born into the nation would be bound by that covenant. This was not an individual covenant. It was a national covenant. Oh, we can even say multi-generational covenant. Every born Jew, uh, every, every Jew that was born after this day was bound to that covenant. So much as a newborn child in the United States is bound to keep the laws of our nation, so we're children to Israel bound to the law. And in this law were promises of blessings for obedience and promises of judgment for disobedience. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1, you shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you set up yourselves I, um, image or, or sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figured stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments, so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in their season, so that the land will yield its produce, and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. So the, the, the Lord reminds the nation not to have idols. Keep God's Sabbath. That's fine. But in this covenant, there are also penalties. Leviticus uh, 26, 14, but if you do not obey me, I do not carry out all these commandments. If instead you reject my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinance so as not to carry out all my commandments, and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over, over you a sudden terror, consumption and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies will eat it up. I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies. And those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. In other words, God ain't playing. You enter into a covenant with God, you better. There, there's no such thing as breaking a covenant with God. There's consequences because God will always always fulfill his end of the bargain. That description, I mean, that's a powerful description. So if no, so if one Israelite fails to keep even one commandment, then the entire nation, it's cursed. And there are some interesting curses in that list, including God allowing Israel's enemies to rule over them, the age of the Gentiles, which we saw. But how can every Jew in Israel remain perfectly compliant with the entire law? It's obvious that the nation was destined from the beginning to experience then curses. This is the word of God. All, all of these curses must take place, not just some. And as we go down the list, we can see many of them have already come to pass. But we can also find some that have yet to come true, like the seven plagues. So if these curses must happen to Israel, yet some have had yet to happen, we should expect to see more in the future. Some of these curses will be found in later chapters of Revelation. And we need to understand that events of tribulation are not random chaos or violence. They are specific. Fulfillment of things promised for Israel as part of the covenant of Moses. God is going to uphold his side of the covenant to keep the terms of the agreement. And furthermore, this covenant was made with a nation, not an individual. So whatever happens under the terms of the covenant, whether good or bad, must happen to the entire nation. The penalties are not handed down on an individual basis, uh, just as uh, all Israel went into Babylon, so will all Israel experience the tribulation. Only if a Jew has come out of from under the law, may they escape the penalties in the law of tribulation. But how does a Jew come from out under the law? By faith in Christ, so that Jesus takes the curses away from him or her. And having taken the curse for us, we are no longer under the curses of the law. It says that in Galatians. For as many are, are as the works of the law are under a curse, for it has been written, Curses everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law to perform them. Now that one is justified by the law, God, before God is evident, the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not, is not a faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Powerful. So Jews who believe in Jesus in our time become part of the church, and as such, they're saved from the wrath. But what about the Jews in tribulation? How can they escape the wrath? It's an interesting question, isn't it? And we'll find that out on Sunday. Okay, uh, for those of you who are on a, uh, 
this, this little clapper, I want to say good night to you guys. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll uh we'll we'll talk about that on Sunday. On Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. For those of you on Spreaker, good night to you guys. Yeah, I would love to stay longer, guys, but I can't because I've got uh, Bible study coming up here. Uh, not Bible study, geez, night prayer coming up here on the top of the hour. So let me close this out. There we go. And I'm going to start music a little later, guys. So we'll be starting here momentarily. Uh, but by the way, if you want to uh, join us for uh, for night prayer, you can certainly do so. Uh, just simply go to bishopjameslong.com. Scroll down to where it says night prayer, and there you go. And that's it. Uh, we're going to be here this Friday for our paranormal show. And of course, Saturday, uh, it'd be an interesting presentation as well. Uh, TikTok, hang tight with me. I'll be with you guys in just a second. Uh, let me open this up to everybody because I, I try to always let everybody come in and say hello real quick. Okay. There we go. Uh, remember, for those, I want to remind everybody, your value does not decrease based on someone's inability or refusal to see your worth. You are priceless. Don't let anybody tell you or convince you otherwise. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, God bless.